Hi, I'm Dr. Roger Schwelt, a board certified pulmonologist, critical care physician, and sleep physician. And I want to welcome you to my master class. You know, there's a lot of voices out there telling us what we need to do to improve our health, optimize our health, our immunity. Some of it actually is based in evidence based medicine, which is what I follow. Some of it really isn't. There's a lot of health myths that we call it. And what I'd like to do in this master class is to go over these and to dispel some of these myths that are not really grounded in evidence-based medicine. So join me as we talk about some of these health myths. And they're in the areas of nutrition, exercise, hot and cold therapy, sleep, and also sunshine and sunlight. So we're gonna start with sunlight because I think this is a myth that a lot of my patients seem to believe. And it's this myth that if you supplement with vitamin D, that you don't need to get sunlight. In other words, the belief that sunlight, the only benefit of sunlight, is to make vitamin D in your skin. Well, we're gonna dispel that myth right now. We know that the sun produces ultraviolet B radiation, among other things, and it's that ultraviolet B radiation that penetrates into your skin and creates vitamin D. Uh, we also know that you can take supplements of vitamin D and get the benefits of that as well. But what's not really understood very well is that sun and sunlight has many other benefits that if you don't go out into the sun, you're going to miss out on that. So in terms of the evidence base, as I mentioned, ultraviolet B radiation does produce vitamin D in your skin. And you can actually get vitamin D orally and from other foods, foods such as mushrooms and, and fortified milk and, and uh, meat and fish and, and those sorts of things. But what happens to the vitamin D once it gets into your system is it has to be metabolized in the liver, and that takes uh, a few days. And then it's metabolized again in the kidney to the active form. What you may not understand is that light affects our body in several different ways, other than outside of vitamin D. One of those ways is light affects our eyes. The light from the sun, or light from any object actually, will go into our eyes and will interact with the retina, which is the portion of our eyeball at the very back of the eye, and stimulate intrinsically photosensitive neuroganglion cells. And these will then project to certain areas of the brain, which can cause uh, some uh, downstream effects. But the other way that light can affect us is something that's not very well understood. Light can affect our skin in more ways than just making vitamin D. In fact, light can penetrate deep down into the skin, sometimes even as far as eight centimeters to interact with receptors in the mitochondria. Now, mitochondria are little organelles inside of all of our cells, except for red blood cells, that are the powerhouses of those cells, and that can cause a, a lot of downstream effects. So let's just sort of back up a little bit and talk how exactly light affects the human body. So as we were talking about, in the eyes, there are really two pathways that light can affect the human body. Number one is it can go to something called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Now, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is just a little area of the brain that is the master clock for the body. It's like the conductor. And this master clock or the conductor of the body of a conductor of an orchestra is regulating all of the processes in the body. It tells you when you have to wake up. It tells you when it's time to go to sleep. It tells you when it's time to build in your body. And it says when it's time to repair and break down. So this is a very important thing. So we'll, as you'll see, uh, as you are exposed to light in the morning, it sets your circadian rhythm in the right place. Whereas if you are exposed to light later on in the day toward evening, it tends to delay your circadian rhythm. So the bottom line here is that it's important for you to get good sun exposure during the day so that your body knows when it's day and when it's night. Okay, that's the suprachiasmatic nucleus, so circadian rhythm. But there's another aspect of light that affects our body, and that's in the perihabenular nucleus. Now, don't get hung up on these names. It's just another area of the brain, but this area of the brain is responsible for mood, for depression, and if it's not activated, it can actually cause depression. So it's very important for you to get enough sunlight to prevent this from happening. There's a condition called seasonal affective disorder, and this affects uh, about 5% of the population, typically in the winter months, when people are not getting enough light. They get up in the morning before the sun rises, and they go home 
well after the sun sets. They're never getting sunlight. And as a result of that, some of these people can actually become depressed. So again, it would be a mistake to think that just by getting vitamin D supplements, you don't need to be out in the sun. Another uh, issue that we talked about was how sun hits the skin and it causes uh, activation of receptors deep down in your skin in the mitochondria. Let's talk a little bit about what mitochondria are. We said that they were the powerhouse of the cell. This is very similar to an engine in a car. The purpose of an engine in a car is to create locomotion for the wheels to spin. Well, here the mitochondria do something very similar. They make energy for the cell. But in the process of making energy, they also create a substance that can actually cause damage to the mitochondria, very similar to what happens in a car. A car is making locomotion, but in the process of doing that, it's also generating heat, heat that could actually shut down the engine if it wasn't for a cooling system, that is. So the, the body has a very similar situation. The mitochondria makes energy, but in the process of making that energy, it also makes something called oxidative stress, which can shut down the mitochondrial engine and actually cause problems. If it's not dealt with this oxidative stress, then it can lead to less optimal health, inflammation, cancer, dementia, diabetes, and even learning disabilities. And so the body has a system in place to take care of this oxidative stress. It has a system for what happens at night, and it has a system for what happens during the day. <clears throat> at night, there's a system in place where the brain, and specifically the pineal gland in the brain, secretes melatonin. Melatonin is very important for the body to be able to uh, signal when it goes to sleep and a number of other clock circadian rhythm uh, systems. But there's something else that's very interesting about melatonin. Aside from all of those actions, melatonin is a very powerful antioxidant. It's actually more powerful than vitamin E. And what this melatonin does when it's circulating through the body at night is it goes into the mitochondria and it mops up all of this oxidative stress that's being caused uh, by the, the actions of the, the energy producing systems of the mitochondria. So we see here that melatonin is very important at night to make sure that your mitochondria are very healthy and they stay healthy. And this, if this doesn't happen, problems can occur like inflammation, cancer, dementia, diabetes, and learning disabilities. But the question is, is what happens during the day? Obviously, during the day, melatonin is not being secreted. And this is because that sunlight shuts down the body's ability to make melatonin because light going to the eyes goes back to the pineal gland through the suprachiasmatic nucleus and shuts that down. So how do we get the cooling system to work during the day? Well, as it turns out, the sun actually, it can produce inter, uh, near infrared radiation, which uh, among other things, uh, like the visible spectrum and ultraviolet light, there's also a lot of near infrared light that comes from the sun. And as being proposed by a lot of authors now, and also what is being shown in a lot of studies, is that melatonin is produced in the mitochondria right where it's needed. And so this is almost like a cooling system, a, um, the water pump or the, 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 um, the oil pump in an engine of a car is that the heat is being produced right there in the cylinder and there is a cooling mechanism to take care of exactly what it is that's happening. So the question is, is here's this myth, this myth that we see uh, often, and that is, is that I don't need to go out in the sun because the vitamin D that I need from the sun, I can get in a capsule. It's interesting to note that today uh, in, uh, in the 21st century, Americans spend only about 7% of their waking hours outside. So one thing I wanna be very clear about, and that is when I say going out into the sun, you don't have to be directly in sunlight to get the benefits of near infrared radiation. Near infrared radiation can penetrate through clothes, through your skin, and actually get deep down into the skin, into the mitochondria. So just being outside, um, you can still wear clothes, you can still wear your sunscreen and not have an issue with near infrared radiation. So just being outside is really the key that I'm talking about. You know, 100, 200 years ago, we spent well over 50% of our waking hours outside. And so it would be a myth to say that it would be a mistake, in fact, to say that you don't need to go outside in the sun because you're taking your vitamin D. Vitamin D is important, but it's also important to get sunlight.
Okay, let's talk about our next myth. Taking a supplement will give you the full benefits of melatonin. So if melatonin is so important, I can just take a supplement and buy it over the counter. Well, there's a lot of uh, misunderstandings in terms of um, melatonin and supplements in general. The first thing I would say is this, is that because supplements are not regulated by the federal government, we don't always know exactly what's in the supplements that we buy at the supermarket or at the, at the, the health food store. Uh, there are systems now being put in place where there are independent companies that review these to make sure that what you're getting over the counter and in a supplement is actually what you're getting. But realize that you might not be getting everything there that you need. So the question is, is it better to get melatonin naturally from your pineal gland or is it better to just supplement and not go out into the sun? Let's talk a little bit about the science behind what's going on there. So one of the things that you have to understand is that melatonin produced at night comes from this thing called the pineal gland, which is in the brain. The thing that you have to understand about that, though, is that the suprachiasmatic nucleus, this thing I was talking about in terms of the conductor, the, the, the thing that runs the, the cycle or runs the, the, the timing of the body, called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, can shut down the pineal gland and does, in fact, do this when light is exposed to the eyes. So whether it's light at night or whether it's light when you go outside during the day, any kind of light going into the eye is going to shut down melatonin secretion from the pineal gland. Now that has a number of, of complications that have to do with it. Number one is, as we've talked about, melatonin is that signal that tells the body that it's time to sleep. And so if you are up late at night, if you are uh, working on your computer and you're getting light into the eyes, this is going to shut down melatonin production and it's going to tell your body, number one, it's not time to sleep. It's going to uh, shift your circadian rhythm in the wrong direction. And not only that, as we've just talked about, you're going to have less melatonin to keep those mitochondrial engines cool. And so the natural conclusion is, well, if I'm staying up late at night and doing all of this, I can just take a melatonin supplement. Well, let's take a look and see what melatonin does. Number one, as we've talked about, it builds throughout the, the day in the pineal gland and gets secreted usually around 9 o'clock p.m. at night. This is called the dim light melatonin onset. And as we've talked about, bright light suppresses that melatonin within minutes. In fact, even if with your eyes closed, if there's any sort of ambient light in the room, that can actually shut down melatonin production and cause it to be delayed uh, later on in the night. So what is the issue then? Um, it's possible that you could take melatonin, but remember that melatonin at night is going to be beneficial only in very small doses. Uh, so one to three milligrams. Oftentimes I see patients taking up to five, even 10 milligrams of melatonin. That high dose is actually going to be counterproductive. The other problem with melatonin uh, supplementation is that you can't take it during the day. You need melatonin during the day as well. And as we said, the, the way to get that is by going out into the sun and having the melatonin produced in the mitochondria itself. If you were to take melatonin orally, that would go throughout your bloodstream and it would signal the cells that it's time to sleep. And clearly during the day, it's not time to sleep. You need this melatonin to be produced in the mitochondria itself not in the bloodstream. So taking a melatonin supplement 24 hours a day is not going to be beneficial. In terms of what's going on at night, uh, I want to make sure that we understand too that light hitting the eyes at night and going to the back of the eye and the, and the, the retina is such a, uh, a huge problem in terms of suppressing melatonin that even small things that you might not realize is affecting your melatonin production uh, can happen. So here's a, a study that was done looking at e-readers and the amount of light coming from an e-reader. And what you're seeing here on this graph is on the x-axis, the different wavelengths of that light. And on the y-axis is the irradiance. Now, what you're seeing here is a nice little graph. It's very easy to see that because that's from the that's from the e-book. OK, now, if you look very carefully at the bottom, you'll see a print book, the amount of light coming from a print book. And that's simply a book that you're reading at night with very dim light. What you're seeing here is that there is a lot more light coming from an e-reader or coming from your smartphone or coming from your computer that is hitting the back of the eye. And as a result of that, let me show you what the consequences of that are. 
Here in the next graph, we're looking at something called sleep latency. Sleep latency is the time it takes for you to fall asleep once you go to bed. And as you can see, the, uh, the higher amount of sleep latency you have, the more minutes of sleep latency, the longer it takes to go to bed. And clearly, the longer it takes to go to sleep was associated with the ebook. Why? Because there was more light coming from that ebook, as opposed to the regular standard book that you're reading with uh, a dim light. So as you can see here, having melatonin around when you're not looking at the e-reader is important for sleep latency. But just also realize that there's a number of other benefits that you get from melatonin as well, including sleep quality. So clearly here, what you can see is that taking supplemental melatonin is going to solve only one of the issues associated with uh, light exposure. It's not going to help out with a number of other issues. Number one, uh, the, the mitochondrial issue during the day. And number two, sleep latency. So we need to make sure the best thing to do is that you're not exposing your eyes to bright light at night, that you are getting plenty of sunshine during the day. And what you'll notice is that your circadian rhythm will be anchored correctly and you'll be able to fall asleep better at night. All right, let's talk about the next myth, which I, I often see, uh, especially on social media, is there is an understanding of antioxidants. People love antioxidants because oxidative stress is bad, as we've just talked to you about. One of the myths is that glutathione is the most powerful antioxidant. I often see supplements of glutathione and N-acetylcysteine, things that work into the glutathione peroxidase system. All of these things are touted as being antioxidants, and they're, they're correct. But the question is, is glutathione, is it the most powerful? And what I want to talk to you about is a, uh, an understanding about what is going on in the cell. And specifically, we're going to use the example of what's going on in COVID-19, which is uh, obviously a, uh, an infection that we're all well aware of. Well, in the body, there is, uh, in the cells, I should say, there are components that are pro-oxidants and that are antioxidants. One of the components that is a pro-oxidant is something called angiotensin II. As you can see here, angiotensin II is a pro-oxidant. But the body has a way of balancing the oxidative stress and the antioxidative uh, component. And so it converts this pro-oxidant angiotensin II into something called angiotensin 1-7. Angiotensin II is a pro-oxidant. Angiotensin 1-7 is actually an antioxidant. So you're getting a, a double switch here. It's kind of like in basketball where you block... The, the, the hoop on one end and go down and score at the other. So it's a kind of a four point switch here. You're taking a pro-oxidant and actually converting it into an antioxidant. So you can see that that's very important. That process is actually mitigated or it's, it's, it's uh, done by ACE2. Now this is important because ACE2 is an enzyme, but it also happens to be the receptor for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Now, anti, the, as we've talked about, angiotensin II is a promoter of ROS, that's reactive oxygen species. Where on, on the other hand, angiotensin 1-7 is an antioxidant. It, it suppresses, it reduces in general, reactive oxygen species. Well, you can imagine what happens when someone gets infected with SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 responds to or binds to the ACE2 receptor. And when it does this, it completely knocks out the ACE2 enzyme. What is that doing? It's upsetting the oxidative balance in the cell. And as you can see here, that the angiotensin 2 starts to build up and the angiotensin 1-7 starts to be depleted because that ACE2 enzyme is being inhibited. And as a result of that, reactive oxygen species goes up. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, the other thing that happens, of course, is when you have a viral infection, you have the white blood cell counts that go up, or the WBCs, which is normally a good thing because that's how white blood cells kill the bacteria. But in this case, with the addition of those white blood cells, that's just adding to the reactive oxygen species that we're talking about here. If you kind of think here, what's going on is you, before you get infected with SARS-CoV-2, are at a balance of where your oxidative stress is. And some people are very close to the cliff, very close to the edge. And some people are very far away from that cliff, very far away from the edge. 
And when they get this infection with SARS-CoV-2, it's like a wind that blows. And if you're very close to the edge of that cliff, you it may be enough where that stress test is, is so uh, large that it may blow you over the cliff. And some people have a lot of room between where they're standing and the cliff. And so they might be blown a little bit, but not enough to topple the, um, the equilibration that's in the cell. So all of this is to say that SARS-CoV-2 causes an upset in the, in the cell that increases reactive oxygen species. So we've already talked though about how we deal with reactive oxygen species or oxidative stress, and that is through the melatonin. Because the, the issue here is that that re reactive oxygen species or that oxidative stress upsets the cell, causes damage to the cell, and that can lead to blood clots and, and hypoxemia, which is lack of oxygen. This is when patients go to the hospital because they're, they can't breathe, they're short of breath, and they go on ventilators. So what is the thing that can actually help this? Melatonin. So melatonin, as I was mentioning before, is a very powerful antioxidant. It's actually twice as powerful as vitamin E. In fact, the melatonin system upregulates glutathione. So it's sort of the, the super regulator of all of the antioxidants. And as we've discussed, there's two ways that you can get melatonin. You can get melatonin at night by not exposing your eyes to bright light, by getting to bed and getting that good night's sleep. That's the melatonin that you want to have. And that melatonin is going to mop up. It's going to get rid of that reactive oxygen species elevation and, and help mitigate that uh, at night. Well, what about during the day? As we've talked about during the day, near infrared radiation from the sun is going to penetrate deep down into your body, into those mitochondria and produce melatonin on site intracellularly in the mitochondria to also reduce reactive oxygen species. So this myth that glutathione is the way to go, it's, it's a very narrow uh, understanding of antioxidant therapy. The big antioxidant, the one that we should be trying to get to as much as possible is melatonin. And think about this. You don't have to go to a store to get melatonin because your body makes it. So the way to fully optimize the way that your body makes melatonin is to make sure that after sundown, after nine o'clock at night, that you're not exposing your eyes to light, you'll get the maximal benefit of melatonin at night. And during the day, when the sun is out, is to get as much sunlight exposure as you can. You don't have to be directly in the sun, you can just be outside and, and have the near infrared rays penetrate. It can penetrate through your clothes, it penetrates through your skin, it even penetrates through a hat that you may have on your head. Near infrared radiation is very good at penetrating through all of those things, but it's not very good at penetrating through homes and new low E glass windows. So make sure you're trying to get outside as much as possible. Another myth that I see often is that uh, I get plenty of sunshine at work through my window. And as we just discussed, the importance of getting sunshine, you know, while the sun is out is very important because of that near infrared radiation. Well, unfortunately, things have changed a little bit. Um, first of all, let's talk about being inside in general. There's a number of lights that we have in our home and that's changed in the last uh, number of decades. What you see here in the graph is the spectrum of light that comes from the sun in orange. And you can see there that there's a lot of light in the visible spectrum, but that light bleeds into the near infrared spectrum and also the ultraviolet spectrum. So it goes pretty far on both sides. Now, what you see in red and blue is the type of lighting that we have inside our homes. First of all, look at the blue. The blue also is widely distributed. In fact, most of the light, most of the energy coming out of a incandescent light bulb that you see there in blue is in the near infrared spectrum. Unfortunately, because of the amount of energy that it takes to run uh, incandescent light bulbs, uh, most places have gotten rid of the use of incandescent bulbs. And now we're going to the very efficient LED bulbs. That is represented in red. As you can see there, most of the energy in a LED bulb is coming through as visible light. And that's on purpose. We want to use energy efficiently. But remember that if we are getting a benefit from near infrared radiation, we can expect to get that benefit inside under LED lights 
when it's not actually producing any near infrared radiation. So that's the, the first problem that we have with remaining inside and being an inside species and not getting outside. And we already know that this is a problem because the average American, as we've said before, only spends about 7% of their waking hours outside. So the only other way that we could potentially get this near infrared light, this near infrared radiation, is through a window. Well, as it turns out, there are many different types of windows. Um, what we see here is the, um, the, the spectrum of light that is able to pass through windows of different types. And specifically, we're looking at the infrared portion of that spectrum, which is bordered here in the red frame. And as we can see there at the top, a clear, regular glass, something that we might have had in a home in the 1950s through the 1970s or even 80s, is able to penetrate, it's able to allow and pass through um, near infrared radiation without any problem. And you can tell that this is the type of glass that you've got because as the sun is coming through that type of window, if you feel the sun's warm rays, that's how we actually interact with near infrared radiation. It feels like warmth on our skin. It can penetrate through our clothes and we can feel it even though we're wearing clothes on our backs or, or wherever it happens to be. That's near infrared radiation. That's a regular glass. But if you have the experience of standing in a window when the sun is coming through and you're not feeling that, there's a very good chance that what you're dealing with there is low E glass. Now, why would they make a window that doesn't allow heat from the sun to come in? Well, the answer is very simple. It's for efficiency. If you can make a window that allows light to come in, but no heat to come in, then you don't have to spend as much money on air conditioning and you don't have to spend as much money in general on electricity for that type of a building. And so because of that, in some places, this is actually the law that new buildings have to be built with low E glass. The problem is, is that as you can see from the graph, depending on if it's a high solar, moderate solar or low solar, there are varying levels of near infrared light that are allowed to pass through the glass and into your skin and, and into the mitochondria where it's needed to make melatonin. So this idea of because you're sitting next to a window at work, you're getting plenty of sunshine may need to be mitigated. You might not know whether or not that's the case. If it's a newer building, there's a very good chance that you've got low E glass and you're not getting the full benefits of getting outside into the sun, which is what you need to do. Let's talk about another myth that we see. Um, it makes no difference when I eat. A calorie is a calorie. So we're going to move away from sunlight and talk about nutrition. Now I'm going to even talk about what type of food you're eating or how much food that you're eating. We're going to simply talk about the timing of when you happen to eat that food. So we all know about the circadian rhythm. We've brought this up before here in the master class. One of the things about the circadian rhythm that's really interesting is that there are certain things that the body do that is timed for the day and that is timed for night. It, it's kind of like a city. You know, um, if you're driving into the city, you would hate to see the, uh, the traffic uh, to be, the, or the, the construction people to be working on freeways while you're trying to commute into the city. No, what they try to do is they try to work on those freeways at night when there's less traffic and use those uh, freeways for commutes uh, during the day. Well, the body also operates very similarly. The body is certainly much more complicated than a city, and it understands that certain processes during the day have to occur and certain processes at night have to occur. And if I were to generalize this, I would say that during the day we're eating and there are certain processes that are building. In other words, when you're eating, you're taking in calories, that's when the body is building you up. Uh, there's a number of cellular processes like mTOR, which are going towards building, building, building. However, at night, you've built these things and there's these structures and protein structures and all of these infrastructure in your body that's been around for years and months. Um, these things can break down. And if we don't repair them, if we don't break them down and rebuild them, we're gonna have poor quality construction. And so just like a city has to repair things, just like a city has to build and repair, our body also has to build and repair. And so one of the ideas here is that by expanding the time that we're eating, um, that we are not allowing enough time for our bodies to repair. Because the problem that we have is that when we are eating, 
we are in a state, our body is in a state of constantly building. And if we are, when we're not eating, we're in a state of repairing. If we're eating at all hours of the day and we're extending the time that we're eating, we don't allow enough time for repair. And that's the idea with something we call time restricted eating or intermittent fasting. So this idea of it doesn't matter when I eat, a calorie is a calorie is true. It is a calorie. But as they say in comedy, timing is everything. And that's exactly the issue. So if we look at the circadian rhythm, we will see that insulin sensitivity, this is the hormone that basically takes glucose and puts it into your cell, is highest actually in the morning. There's been a number of studies that have looked at this. This study was published back in 2012, and they looked at the pattern of insulin secretion and insulin activity in healthy individuals. And they found, as they showed here in this study, that um, production tended to be lower and that insulin sensitivity tended to be higher at breakfast than at lunch or at dinner. So what insulin sensitivity means is that you won't need as much insulin in the morning to get that glucose down to a regular level. And that's going to show improvement in terms of obesity down the road. So they've done a lot of research on this and they've looked at whether or not if we were to scrunch the amount of times that we're eating into a smaller area to allow more time for that, for that repair, whether or not that would have an impact in our overall longevity and health span. And this was a study that was published um, not too long ago, looking at 11 overweight adults for just four days. And this was a randomized crossover study, which means that each member of the, of the, of the subjects were their own control group. And as you can see here, what they did is looking at the control, which is on the top line, and the time-restricted eating, which is on the bottom line, is instead of having breakfast at 8 o'clock in the morning, lunch at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and dinner at 8 o'clock at night, they scrunched the time down so that breakfast was at 8 o'clock in the morning, lunch was at 11 o'clock in the morning, and dinner was at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. In every other way, it was the same, the same number of calories for breakfast and the same total calories for the day, okay? So they didn't tell them what to eat. They didn't tell them how much to eat. All they did was they said, this is when you have the opportunity to eat. So what was the result after just four days? Well, we can look at a number of things. This, what we're looking at here are the clock genes. Remember we talked about circadian rhythm again. These circadian rhythm clock genes were looked at in a number of different uh, types. So you can see here that we have BMAL1, clock, PER1, PER2, CRY1, CRY2. These are all genes that are actually affecting the cycle of the circadian rhythm. So in each of these categories are four graphs. The, four, the first two are in the morning and the second two are in the evening and the dark one are those that are doing time restricted feeding and the white ones are those that are doing the control. And let me explain to you what we're basically seeing here is that not only does light affect our circadian rhythm, but also when we eat, it affects our circadian rhythm. So if we're eating more in a, in a concentrated area in the morning, that what that is going to do in addition to light is it's going to reset our circadian rhythm in a way that is more regular. The other thing that they saw was improved glycemic control. In other words, the blood sugars were lowered in the 24 hour glucose levels. There was less ups and downs because the meals were spread out in the control group. There was ups and downs, ups and downs. With the time restricted eating, they were closer together and it was more regular. There was less ups and downs. The other thing that they noticed is that when they concentrated the meals in the morning like they did in the time-restricted eating group is that morning cortisol levels were higher, which is exactly when you need them to be higher to take on the stresses of the day. And at night, the cortisol levels were lower, which is exactly what you need to go to sleep. And so I, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who, when they do time-restricted eating, when they restrict their eating to the morning, have a much better time going to bed at night more easily. The other thing that they noticed was that there was an improvement in something called BDNF. BDNF gene is, stands for the brain-derived neurotrophic factor. 
This is a factor that actually supports the neurons of the brain and allows them to live longer and to do better and to maturate. So this is also something that's also very good. And as you can see there on the graph to the right, the BDNF graph showed that those that were doing time-restricted eating had higher levels both in the morning and in the evening of this BDNF gene. Really quickly, the other two things that they noticed was the sirtuins. So the sirtuin-1 gene, which uh, regulates sirtuins, which has been very heavily associated with longevity, was shown to be higher in people who did time-restricted eating. And then finally, the LC3A. This is an essential structural component that causes something called autophagy. What's autophagy? It's that thing I was talking about before, where at night, your body is breaking down old stuff so that in the next cycle, it can build it back better. Well, that was significantly higher in those people that were doing time-restricted eating. So what does time-restricted eating do? Here's the myth again. Remember, a calorie in the morning is the same as a calorie at night. That may be true from just an energy perspective, but in terms of what your body is expecting and in terms of what needs to be going on, think about this. Think about it in this sense. If you've got to travel into the city, right? And you are living in one place and your destination is in the city. Whether you travel at night or whether you travel during the day, it's the same distance. It's exactly the same distance. You're going to use the same, uh, same distance to get there. But if you travel during the peak traffic hours, it's going to take you longer to get there. And it's going to take you more fuel to get there. Whereas if you travel when there's not a lot of traffic, you can get there very quickly, very easily in a short amount of time. So while a calorie is the same at, in the morning as it is at night, there definitely is a better time to eat that calorie. And what time-restricted eating and the research shows us is that is exactly the case. Okay, so we're going to switch gears now and move away from time-restricted eating and talk a little bit more about the immune system. One of the most frequent calls to pediatricians and doctors in general is when someone has a fever. And this myth of that you always need to treat a fever to get the temperature down uh, because it's bad to have a fever, I think is something that we really need to attack. So let's talk a little bit about the immune system first. The immune system really is divided into two components, the innate immune system, which you see there on the left, and the adaptive immune system, which you see there on the right. The innate immune system, when you're born, it's very powerful, it's very strong, and it's the actual aspect of the immune system that is responsible for creating a fever. Now, the adaptive immune system, uh, as opposed to the innate immune system, is pretty immature when you're born, and it takes some years to get stronger and stronger. And the reason is, is because it's being exposed to antigens all throughout life, and it's learning which antibodies it needs to make. As opposed to the adaptive immune system on the right, the innate immune system is strong when you're young. You know, we know that kids get fevers at the drop of a hat, but gets weaker and weaker as you get older, as we, we can see from uh, some of this. Now, some of the cells in the innate immune system are cells like the monocytes, the natural killer cells. These are cells that go out and not only find pathogens that need to be eradicated and gobbled up, but they also find damaged cells of our own that need to be gobbled up and <laughs> broken down so that we can build it back better. So the innate immune system is actually very important. So as I was mentioning, the innate immune system is responsible for creating a fever. What scientists believe is that the fever is not only a mechanism to destroy and to help get rid of viruses and bacteria, but it also is a signal because the immune cells of your body act differently when there is a high temperature versus a normal temperature. And that's mitigated through something called interferon, which is the major byproduct of the innate immune system. So there was a study that was published a number of years ago titled Hyperthermia in Humans Enhances Interferon Gamma Synthesis and Alters Peripheral Lymphocyte Population. So they've known for many years that temperature can affect the way things go, but what they did particularly in this study is they took individuals and took the lymphocytes out of their bodies at certain temperatures and then activated them with something called a mitogen, which tells the, the cells that there's something out there that they need to do something about. And they recorded the amount of interferon that was coming out of that cell. So looking at this graph, what you see here on the x-axis is the temperature 
at which the lymphocyte was taken out of the human body and tested. You can see there are 37 degrees, 37 and a half, 38, 38 and a half, and 39. And on the y-axis, what we're measuring is the amount of interferon coming out of that cell at that temperature. This is the amount of interferon released from the lymphocytes after mitogen stimulation at different body temperatures. And what you can clearly see there is that at 39 degrees Celsius, which is about 103 degrees Fahrenheit, you have a tenfold increase, a tremendous increase in interferon response. So interferon is very aptly named because it actually interferes with viral infections. There's been some recent publications done on this. This is uh, in the very prestigious journal Science, which looked at interferon responses in people with COVID-19. Now, this is not just in COVID-19. I'm just using this as an example. This happens in just about any viral infection. But what you can see here is that as the amount of interferon secretion goes down in these patients, the nature of the severity of COVID-19 goes up. So you can see there in the blue, in mild disease, a very large interferon response. In severe disease, purple, slightly less. And in critical disease, even less still. Well, if we look at overall interferon activity, again, in the graph on the right, mild, very high interferon activity. Severe in purple, less. And then finally, critical, almost no interferon activity at all. So the question really comes up is, if somebody has a fever, is it really in the best interest of that patient to get rid of the fever? We're always worried about the fever. We're always treating the fever. Why are we doing that? I think, I think the thing that we have to understand here is that a fever is the body's natural way of trying to fight off an infection. This is the body's natural, innate way of trying to do that. That fever, as we're seeing here in the study, causes the lymphocytes to secrete more interferon. And as we're seeing here in this study particularly, is that an increased interferon response is actually good in terms of outcomes. So there's a lot of ways that we can mimic that uh, increased body temperature. Uh, hot and cold therapy, uh, has, there's many different ways of doing that. Um, contrast showers is one way of doing that, which is where you go in every day into the shower, have a hot shower, and then finish it off with cold. Uh, there are baths. There are, there's a lot of data on saunas where people go into saunas uh, and, and they spend about 20 minutes there at about 174 degrees Fahrenheit and then finish it off with something cold. The Finns have been doing this for many years. Um, it's, it's almost endemic in, in Finland. Almost everybody does it. And there's been a lot of scientific research that shows that doing sauna treatments is not only beneficial for cardiovascular health, but actually reduces all-cause mortality, which has been associated with all-cause mortality. The other thing that uh, is done is our fomentations. This is where you get hot towels that are heated up and, and safely placed on the patient to heat up their body temperature. In other words, there's many different ways of doing this. But heating up the body temperature during an acute infection is beneficial in terms of increasing interferon and, um, and, and, and antiviral therapy. A couple of cautions, of course, when someone has a really high fever, that can cause the heart rate to be very fast. That's something that may need to be treated uh, by a physician. If someone also has a high fever and is delirious, that's also another reason why it might need to be treated. So generally speaking, uh, regular fevers, something I generally do not treat with Tylenol or with other uh, types of um, uh, medications to bring down that fever. High fevers need to be taken uh, seriously because they can cause uh, seizures and things of that nature. But those are in the minority. So a myth is, is that anytime anyone has a fever, we have to treat it. I think we've busted that myth. Another myth that I often see is that cold temperatures can cause viral infections. They say, don't go out into the cold, you're gonna get a viral infection. Well, as it turns out, the US Army actually uh, sponsored a study that was done at the University of Toronto that looked at what we were just talking about in our last myth. They took subjects that were doing a lot of exercise and or that were uh, in a very hot bath, basically. So anything that increased their body temperature, and then they subjected them to a cold bath or a cold temperature. And what they found during this, uh, this study was that natural killer cells, which are part of the innate immune system, 
and the lytic units in those cells went up with cold water immersion. In fact, the authors of this study said, this study suggests that despite popular beliefs that cold exposure can precipitate a viral infection, the innate component of the immune system is not adversely affected by a brief period of cold exposure. Indeed, the opposite seems to be the case. The fall in core body temperature resulting from cold exposure led to a consistent and statistically significant mobilization of circulating cells, an increase in natural killer cell activity, and elevations in circulating IL-6 concentrations. Now, they did this with seven subjects, and with just seven subjects, they found this to be statistically significant. So this was a very powerful effect. And if you look, actually, at a number of things that different cultures do, let's take Finland for one. They have many saunas. In fact, there are so many saunas in Finland that if everybody in Finland were to go into their sauna at once, there would still be room for you and me to get in there. 99% uh, of the population does a sauna at least once a week. And so if you look at what they do, they go into the sauna for about 20 to 30 minutes at a very high temperature, about 174 degrees Fahrenheit or more. And they do this for about 20 minutes and they come out and they expose themselves to cold, either a cold shower or they go roll around in the snow or into a cold pond. And then they get back in and they go back into the sauna for another round of 20 minutes. And so this up and down, up and down really has an effect on the immune system that we can see is, is quite positive. But it's not just the Finns that do this. This has been actually uh, practiced in many different cultures in many different parts of the world. And there always seems to be at the end of it, <clears throat> this cooling off after a heating. So it's a, a period of, of heating followed by a very short period of cooling. So this myth that cold exposure is going to increase viral infection actually when it's coupled together with a preheating period is actually very beneficial. Another myth that I see often is that, uh, hey, if I've got to stay up all night, it's okay to do that because I got to get this work done for tomorrow and it's not really going to affect my health because it's only one night. It's not like I'm going a long time without sleep. Well, actually, this was a study that was published in the proceeds of the National Academy of Sciences, published back in 2018. And uh, it, it was a very interesting study in that it took six, just six healthy men in their 20s. These are the people that you would think would be able to uh, take a one uh, to be do an all-nighter, right? This is what happens in college right before final exams. They stayed at a research center. No cell phones were allowed or screens. And they slept for two days at night at baseline. They transitioned into staying awake at night and sleeping during the day, as well as also eating during the night. So they basically completely flipped. They were eating at first during the day, and then they ate at night, and they stayed awake at night. And what they did was the scientists took, four, took blood samples every four hours on over 1,129 proteins to see what this effect did to these uh, proteins, very important proteins. Well, what they found was astonishing. About 10% of these proteins completely switched their peak time, as, according to the circadian rhythm. Uh, and many of these changes appeared even after just one day. So by the second day, there were changes that they saw already. And what's really concerning was the type of proteins that they saw that were being changed. Let's talk about just two of those. Number one, glucagon. Glucagon is a protein that is secreted by the pancreas, and it's supposed to elevate blood sugar when more blood sugar is needed. Um, this actually rose higher at night than what would normally be seen in the daytime in these subjects. And that, of course, is a risk for diabetes. So just after one night, they saw this pretty impressive change. There's also another protein called FGF19. Now, FGF19 is probably something that you don't know about, but it's something that you would really be interested in because FGF19 boosts calorie burning. This is what you want to do if you want to lose weight. This protein actually decreased and there was less calorie burning after one of these night episodes of doing an all-nighter. And so, of course, this is a, a risk for weight gain. The authors of the study say uh, that staying awake at night and sleeping during the day for even just one 24-hour period can rapidly lead to changes in more than 100 proteins in the blood, including ones that have an effect on blood sugar, immune function, and metabolism. Over time, these biochemical changes in the blood protein levels can elevate your risk of health issues such as diabetes, weight gain, and even cancer because it affected the immune system. 
Uh, so this is really important to understand is that even doing an all-nighter, one-nighter, okay, is going to cause problems down the road. Uh, it's going to make your body less optimal and it's going to cause a lot of these problems. So I mean, you can imagine if you're doing something maybe not so extreme, but on a regular basis, the effect that that could have on your body. All right, the next myth that I often see is that, boy, I got to do exercise. I know exercise is really good. The more exercise I do, the better it's going to be for me. That's actually not the case. There's something that's well described in the literature, and it's called this J curve. Now, let me explain that to, a little bit to you. I, I foresee that there's probably two different types of people in my audience. There's the people that are uh, maybe don't exercise as much as they should. They maybe like to stay on the couch and watch television, although they know that they need to exercise. Those are those people in this graph that are on the far left, okay? They're at sort of the zero mark in terms of upper respiratory tract infections. We'll use that as a surrogate. And then there are those in the audience that are very, very good at exercising. They get out there, they may even do marathons. And they're on the right side of this graph, way at the top. Where we want to be in terms of infections on this J-curve is at the bottom. Notice what you have to do to have the lowest incidence of upper respiratory tract infections. You need to have moderate exercise. That's the key. If you're sedentary, if you're not doing anything, then you're going to have sort of the standard amount of infections. As you start to do, as soon as you get up off the couch and start to do uh, activity, some exercise, and you don't need to go to 24-hour fitness, you don't need to go to the gym, you don't need to be pumping iron. We're talking moderate exercise three times a week, maybe 20 minutes a day. That's the type of exercise that we're talking about so that you can minimize your infection risk. Once you start going above that, once you start doing a lot more exercise than that, you're actually putting a stress on the body and a stress on your immune system. There was a great study that was done a number of years ago by Jennifer Heiss, who's the Fit Lab director at McMaster University. And she works at a university. There's a number of students around her that she could use for subjects. And in the last six weeks of the term, when students are about to go under a lot of stress, mental stress, I mean, they're they're here, they're trying to learn, trying to take their exams, their careers and everything like that. What she decided to do was to uh, randomize them to three different groups. The first group was the control group. They did nothing. The second group and the third group were very similar in that they did exercise three times a week, 20 minutes a day. But the differences between those two groups was the first group was moderate continuous exercise. So they got their heart rates up to about 70% of their maximum. Whereas the high intensity groups, they got their heart rates up to 80, even 90% of their maximal predicted heart rate. And so the question was, is which groups would do better in terms of depression, in terms of cytokines, in terms of inflammation? And so she measured them after six weeks of therapy. And what she saw was pretty astounding. When we're talking just about depression, this is really actually quite eye-opening, is that those students that did nothing in the control group after six weeks of stress had higher levels on their Beck depression inventory too. This is a very validated way of measuring depression. But notice what happened in the moderate intensity exercise group. They actually had a reversal of depression. They were actually less depressed than when they started out the study six weeks prior. Same could be said also for the high intensity. So high intensity, moderate intensity, both very good at reducing depression. However, when we looked at anxiety and perceived stress, the moderate intensity exercise group actually had better results than either the control who weren't doing any exercise or the high intensity exercise. So clearly you can see again, this understanding of this J curve, which is really important. The other thing that she measured was tumor necrosis factor alpha and IL-6. And you can see in both cases, the moderate intensity exercise group, not the high intensity or the control groups, but the moderate intensity group had the best outcomes in terms of cytokines, which could be detrimental to the human body. So this understanding, and I want to make sure that this is really clear. A lot of times people who are not doing as much exercise as they know they need to do feel like they have to do so much to get the benefits. That's actually not the case. You need to do a moderate amount. So going outside into the sun, breathing in the fresh air, doing some gardening. This is the type of exercise that we're talking about, not strenuous exercise in terms of, um, in terms of all of these benefits.
As you can see, there are many misconceptions about immunity and health, and there are numerous different voices out there telling you what's optimal. So what I've done is I've shown you a number of these myths and how we corrected it. We actually have a course which goes into this in much more depth and actually gives you real world examples about how to optimize your health and to harness the information that we've just gone over and much more information that we're about to go over and allow you to take advantage of that opportunity. Here's how my course is different. It's gonna be based on peer reviewed published research because I don't want you to take my word for it, okay? I'm not just another talking head that's gonna tell you what to believe. I wanna actually show you, I want you to understand, and I wanna take you for this ride to show you why the data shows why this is the case. I'm gonna explain these concepts very clearly, and you're not gonna need a medical degree to understand this. We're gonna explain it at a very normal level so that anybody can understand. We're gonna explain the anatomy, we're gonna explain the physiology, and so you will know by the end of this course everything that you need to know and the reasons why you need to do this to implement this in your life. And finally, there are going to be practical and simple strategies that you're going to be able to do right away. Hey, I'm glad you enjoyed this masterclass. We have other masterclass videos on our channel and more on the way. So click the notification bell below so you don't miss our weekly videos. I'll see you next time.